Good morning, Pequannock Community Church. Good morning. <laughs> uh, I'm laughing because uh, I think we've been decimated by um, uh, upper respiratory infections, uh, not COVID in most cases, but um, I, I'm suffering. You can hear a little bit in my voice, uh, a little bit, and I'm not. I, I'm not infectious. I don't have COVID, but. Um, uh, we, there are several of us who are having our allergy problems uh, far worse than usual. And I don't know if that's because we were all sequestered for two years. I wonder if that makes a difference. Now we're getting out and it's a particularly lush spring. And so I've got, <coughs> I've, I'm uh, allergy boy here this morning. That's a, a true confession for those of you who are watching around the world. I welcome to you if you're watching on Facebook Live. Uh, or on YouTube or one of the other platforms that we are hooked up to. Uh, and if you're here in the sanctuary, uh, thank you for being here. And uh, we are going to enjoy a time of worship and praise nonetheless. Um, there's no youth group tonight. Uh, Brian is away. Uh, he and Paula are helping their daughter move into her new home. Isn't that great? Uh, down in Arkansas, I believe it is. Um, and so that's exciting. Hi, Brian and Paula, if you're watching us, uh, glad to have you with us. And <coughs> um, there, uh, our Bible study uh, is uh, starting the book of Hebrews on Tuesday. Uh, so Tuesday, Thursday at 1230, if you're here uh, in the, uh, room six or on Zoom, you're welcome to join us. Brand new study, book of Hebrews. And um, we have completed our book club for the spring, so no more Thursday afternoon. Uh, but we do have our prayer time on Tuesday at uh, about 1.45 oh, on Zoom. So all of that's happening this week. And next Sunday, I won't be here, but uh, Mel Sharp is going to be preaching in my place. Uh, and I hope you'll come and listen to Mel. He, he's uh, continuing our series uh, looking at the coming of the Holy Spirit between Easter and Pentecost. Uh, you will notice in your bulletin there is uh, an insert card, which I don't have a copy of, but um, you all got a little insert card. Now there are at least three or four different uses for this card. It's a multi-purpose card. <clears throat> and that is, and if you're watching online, you don't need a card. You can do this digitally. So if you uh, first of all, in the bulletin, you'll see that we are um, asking people to adopt a room. Uh, and the ones that are checked, people have already said that they would take care of. And what that means is that um, if you're going to be assigned to one of these rooms, that um, until you tell us you're not, um, so for, for the future, uh, at least the rest of this year, um, you're going to Whenever you're here in the building, you're going to take a look at the room you've assigned yourself to, and you're going to ask yourself if there's some way you can keep it cleaner or, or improve its looks somehow. Um, we have vacuum cleaners. We have dusting stuff and all that available to you. Most of us know where all that stuff is. If you don't, ask me, and I'll tell you. Um, and even if you typically watch us online um, but can make your way over to the building when nobody's here, um, uh, we'd love to have you adopt a room. So that's the, on, in all of your bulletins. We did not print, uh, for reasons of privacy, we didn't print the, the second list that is in the bulletin that's here in the sanctuary, a list of people who are typically shut in or unable to come to worship on a regular basis for a variety of reasons, not always health. And so uh, that list is not static. It changes from time to time. But we... Uh, want you to also adopt one of those people. And so uh, think about writing a card, use the card, write it out, a note to them. Uh, if you don't know their address, you can drop the card in the basket in the back of the church and we'll mail it. Um, so there's lots of ways of using that. Um, we also, if you don't want to use the plain brown card, you know, there are things called greeting cards. You can actually go to a store, a Hallmark store, believe it or not, and this is not an advertisement. And you can buy a card for that person. And you can mail it to them. Or you can be in touch with them some other way. Uh, just 
we want our people to know that this congregation cares for one another. Uh, finally, um, <coughs> finally, um, uh, new use for the card, uh, and that is um, we are um, using this card as a way of communicating one to another good ideas that we might have for the future. Uh, so if you have a bright idea, something you'd like to see us do, uh, something, some way we can improve our ministry, write it down on the card and send the card to us. So there's all kinds of possibilities, and we're just using these cards to communicate with one another in ways we might not otherwise do. All right. That's a long set of announcements, but I wanted you to know what the cards are for. And uh, so if those of you who are watching online, hope you'll um, find a way of engaging with us that way as well. Uh, let's just calm our hearts, get ourselves ready for worship, and then in a moment we'll uh, engage with what's in the bulletin. And if you're here in the sanctuary and you're able, stand with me as we confess together those things most commonly believed among us. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You can be seated. <clears throat> Scripture tells us that on the night he was betrayed, as he sat at table with his disciples, our Lord took bread, he blessed and broke the bread, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took a cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Come then from east and west, come from north and south, come to the table of the Lord. Come not because you must, but because you may. Come not to express an opinion, but to seek a presence. Come, for all is ready. Ministering one with another in his name, we share the bread and the cup. Come as you will, when you will.
wait in silence, my soul is still before the Lord. He is my rock and my salvation, my fortress strong. I'll trust in him. I'll not be shaken. I'll not be shaken. For all my hope is in his love. From God alone comes my salvation. I'll wait and trust his steadfast love. Put not your hope in gain of riches. Seek not your rest in empty wealth. The rich are weak, the poor are mighty, who turn to God alone for help. I'll not be shaken, I'll not be shaken, for all my hope is in his love. From God alone comes my salvation. I'll wait and trust his steadfast love. <clears throat> Pour out your heart to God our refuge and trust in him to hear you cry. No other hope will never fail you. No other love will not run dry. I'll not be shaken. I'll not be shaken. For all my hope is in his love. From God alone comes my salvation. I'll wait and trust his steadfast love. I'll not be shaken, I'll not be shaken, for all my hope is in his love. From God alone comes my salvation. I'll wait and trust his steadfast love. I'll wait and trust his steadfast love. The psalm is Psalm 23, we'll read in unison together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart 
be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song. You are good, good, oh, 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 let the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails, the anchor in the waves, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins, the echo of my days, oh, he is my song. You are good, good, oh. never gonna let me down you're never gonna let never gonna let me down you're never gonna let never gonna let me down you're never gonna let never gonna let me down you're never gonna let never gonna let me down you're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. When the night is holding on to me, God is holding on. When the night is holding on to me, God is holding on. When the night is holding on to me, God is holding on. Pray with me, will you? Father God, <clears throat> you are holy in all your deeds, in all your ways. You are good. You are so good. All of our times are in your hands. Our hope is in you. We place our trust in you, Father. From age to age, you are the same you never change. Your heart never ceases to be turned toward us. And so we are able to come boldly before you. We're able to bring our whole heart to you because in you our whole heart is safe. And Father, the circumstances of this world are no difficulty to you. We do not understand when things go the way they do sometimes. The war in Ukraine, people with illnesses and death all around us. Father, we do not understand poverty. We do not understand anger, hatred between people. 
but none of it's a difficulty to you because you are good. You are utterly holy. And so we can come boldly before you and proclaim that Christ has risen, that Christ is seated on the throne beside you where all is right and all is good. And so, Father, we ask that you would teach us to interpret the times in light of your eternal glory, your eternal sovereignty over all of us. We ask that you'd teach us to walk with Christ in our daily paths, the things that you present to us every day, that we might be proclaimed to be children of God in the midst of of a crooked and perverse generation. And Father, we proclaim you as the eternal Christ who taught us to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord is my guide and friend. I rest well when I'm with him. No hunger or thirst or anxious need when my Lord is here with me. His love is my resting place. My shepherd is kind and full of grace. The arms of my Lord are strong and safe. His love is my resting place. The shadow of death may fall with darkness upon my way, but always my Lord is near to me. His love my resting place. His love is my resting place. My shepherd is kind and full of grace. The arms of my Lord are strong and safe. His love is my resting place. Your goodness will be my feast. Your kindness will overflow. And always your love will follow me. And your heart will be my home. His love is my resting place. My shepherd is kind and full of grace. The arms of my Lord are strong and safe. His love is my resting place. His love is my resting place. My shepherd is kind and full of grace the arms of my lord are strong and safe his love is my resting place his love is my resting place his love is my resting place
epistle today is taken out of the letter of Paul to the church in Galatia, chapter 3, verses 21 to 29. Paul writes, Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everyone under sin so that the promise of faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming of faith would be revealed. So then, the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian, for in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise.
If you're here in the sanctuary and you're able, please stand with me for the reading of the gospel. Turn and face the word. The gospel this morning is taken from Luke's gospel, the 24th chapter. Sorry about that. The 24th chapter, the 44th through the 53rd verses. Then Jesus said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written, that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany. And lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There's a kind of social faux pas movie stars, sports personalities, royalty and the like do everything that they possibly can not to make. It's a social faux pas they make every effort not to make. See, these people go out of their way and spare no expense in order to make sure that they never appear in public wearing the same outfit twice, right? It's a badge of honor. It's a, a, a mark of power and prestige and of wealth that these folks, well, I don't suppose you could really call Queen Elizabeth and Elon Musk folks. Uh, but anyway, these people use their clothes as a demonstration to everyone that I'm a leader. I would never wear last year's fashions, right? That's what they do. These people, uh, they're called the glitterazzi by some reporters. They sometimes have a social conscience, though, and they make every effort to pass on last year's fashions to deserving millionaires, perhaps. Um, though I think that most of them would be mortified if they showed up at the Met Gala, which happened this past week, for instance, and were to run into somebody wearing last year's dress that they'd passed on. Oh, how gauche. But in that vein, if you were basically alive between 2010 and 2015, you probably learned a little bit about the duties of a person called a valet or valet, depending on how you want to pronounce that, or a lady's maid, by watching the television series Downton Abbey on TV. I know, I know. Real men don't watch Downton Abbey. Well, I did. I liked it. I'm secure enough to admit that I got hooked. This week, I even watched the... Uh, the 
advance uh, videos for the new one that's coming out. They've got a new movie coming out, end of this month. Right? So valets and ladies' maids were, in the aristocracy of the time, people whose function was quite simply to manage the wardrobe of the rich and famous. Now off the estate and in film, sometimes these people were called dressers. And that's where our look at Luke 24, 44 through 53 begins. So you've got that in your bulletin or on your digital copy. See, Jesus says to the apostles, doesn't he? Stay in the city until I pick out next year's fashion for you and dress you, right? Well, he doesn't say it quite that way, but that's the import of it. He says, stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high, until I come and clothe you, until I come and dress you. But that begs the question then, what was for the apostles, what was last year's fashion, spiritually speaking? You know, it's not like the apostles were spiritually naked before Jesus clothed them, clothed them with the Holy Spirit. So what were they already wearing, and how were they clothed already before the day of Pentecost? couple of ways. First, I think that they were clothed in Jesus' words. We who live in the digital age can have little or no appreciation of the spoken word as it was experienced before the invention of recorded sound by Edison and others around 1880. Nor can we grasp the value that the spoken word had for people who lived before the invention of mass media via the printing press around 1440. Both of these inventions revolutionized the ability of humankind to remember exactly, and for posterity, words that had been spoken. Some inventions come along with a sort of a chicken and egg fashion and seem exactly fitted to their times. For example, can we say that the Reformation needed a printing press? Or can we say that the printing press was there waiting for a Reformation? Almost like the printing press needed something big to broadcast. Moments like these serve to shrink the world around us to a more manageable size. That, I believe, history will demonstrate as it looks back on the internet and its invention around 1995 by Al Gore. The first century after the birth of Christ saw the invention of the book. The book was invented while Jesus was alive. So before the time of Jesus, heavy scrolls needed to be laboriously rolled out on a desk in order to be read so that words written in an earlier time could be heard. Books made with sheets of similarly sized parchment bound together between boards were much more portable, much more usable, much more user-friendly. They were uniquely fitted to the expansion of Christianity in the first century. You could carry them with you. These early books were called codexes, and surviving codexes, even fragments of codexes, serve as the primary sources today for biblical scholarship and for translation. So what does Jesus mean when he says, at the beginning of our passage today, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you? What does he mean? See, because he doesn't have a scroll with him. 
He didn't bring a scroll out there. He doesn't have a book in his hand. To the best of our knowledge, at the time that Jesus said this, nobody had yet bothered to take a single one of his words and write it down. These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you. See, the first way in which Jesus' disciples were clothed during his earthly ministry is they were clothed in his words, but not the way you and I experience it today. Without even being conscious that it was happening to them, Jesus had bathed them. He had bathed his disciples, and especially the apostles. He had bathed them in the things that he said over and over again. We all experience this kind of clothing in our lives. You know, if I asked you to recall to me some of the things that your parents said. Now, some of your parents have been dead for decades. You could do it. You could remember the things they said. Why? Because they said them over and over. And there'd be a few things that you could recall exactly because your mom and dad said them so often. You could even recall the tone with which they said them. These men had traveled with Jesus everywhere he went from one to three years. We don't know exactly how, how long it was. One of the accusations that was leveled against Peter when he huddled by the fire the night of Jesus' trial was your accent betrays you. Your accent betrays you. Some commentators have thought that it was more than just that he was a Galilean or a regional accent. They've, they've said that Peter had so studied Jesus that he was beginning to sound like him. Peter, John, James, and the rest of the apostles had been clothed they were dressed in Jesus' words. Those words were their outer garments, if you will. And they were of fine brocade, deeply embroidered, and their colors were of blue and purple and scarlet and gold woven together. Those of you who've been part of our Bible study, that is familiar language. Find it in Exodus, in the instructions given to Moses for the building of the tabernacle. Blue and purple and scarlet and gold. That's how the temple was to be dressed. The sons of Aaron, the first priests of Israel around 1200 B.C., wore a bronze plate on their turban. On the plate, there was an inscription the words, holy to the Lord. Jesus had clothed his disciples in the holiness of God. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit that you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. See, they were, they, were, they were dressed in the words of Christ. You know, the main objection that Jesus had to the Pharisees was that they, in his words, did not know the scriptures or the power of God. Metaphorically, they were improperly dressed for the times in which they lived. Oh, they had access to the sacred writings, but all these complications that they had added to them made the simple clothing of holiness as ridiculous as was the brief experiment with women's dresses back in the 1890s that included a bustle. Yeah, you're laughing because, you know, how on earth were these women expected to sit down? I've never been able to figure that out. I see the fashion and I think, wow. How could you possibly sit in a thing like that? It would be so uncomfortable. 
the outer garment is a garment of praise, not a garment of restriction. Next, Jesus tells us about their undergarments. While Jesus had carefully clothed the apostles in what Isaiah calls the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, Jesus reminds them of the rather substantial foundation that he had used on which to overlay the garment of his words. Look at the second half of verse 44. In order that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Now, <clears throat> I remember my grandmother, who was born in 1891, often talked about her underwear as her foundation. <laughs> These garments made absolutely no sense to you know, a, a young child of mid-century America. My underwear at the time was a simple pair of Fruit of the Loom tidy whities and a t-shirt. Why would anybody, why would anyone corset themselves, to corset their body into something that hugs you tightly all the way from here to, well, you get the idea, all the way from, yeah. And yet, that's exactly the effect that the foundation of the law of Moses had on the people of Israel by the time of Jesus. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, among other leading parties of the time of Christ, had corseted the people of Israel tightly into the law. Jesus sparred with the Pharisees and often mentioned how they had corseted the law around the people. Jesus said, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat, so do and observe whatever they tell you but not the works that they do. For they preach, but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move even their finger. In other words, the Pharisees were telling the people, you all, must wear the law tightly like a corset. We, on the other hand, will wear a muumuu, thank you very much. So far as I know, Jesus never included the prophets and the Psalms in his discussions with the Pharisees. He often quoted the law. This moment here in Luke 24 is unique that way. Jesus dressed his disciples in a much more appropriate foundation than just the law. See, if you only have the law and you don't have the prophets or the Psalms, you don't have a complete foundation. Why? Well, the law of Moses is mainly written in a form that we would probably call legalese. You can't really call it prose. I had an argument with myself about this uh, a couple of days ago as I was trying to figure out what to call it. You can't really call it prose because there's no narrative there. It's just laws. It's descriptive. The books of the law, that's parts of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, have hardly any poetic writing in them. Now, six Old Testament books are entirely poetry. Job, the Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, and Lamentations are entirely poetic in nature. The rest of the Old Testament contains a mix of prose and poetry, depending on what you're reading, historic narrative mixed with meaningful, even tender moments. The prophets included a good deal of poetic writing in their admonitions to Israel and Judah. We can learn from this what contemporary American poet Scott Cairns has observed. He said, one of the reasons I enjoy poetry is that a good poem 
insists that a reader learn to honor ambiguity, that he learn to collaborate with a poem's suggestive possibilities. That is to say, a great poem, even a good one, isn't ever done saying what it has to say. A great poem, even a good one, isn't ever done saying what it has to say. I think Jesus included the words, the prophets and the Psalms here in verse 44, because he wanted to restore for his disciples the very loose fitting underwear, if you will, that the ancient writings had been designed to clothe the people of Israel in. He did this so that they could move about freely and yet still have the foundation that they needed in order to wear the garment of praise. The late Eugene Peterson said that he noticed something when he was writing his paraphrase of the Bible that's called The Message. His observation was that all the Old Testament writers were poets. If that's true in any sense, then the word of God is not so much black and white as it is the way that author Tish Warren Harrison characterizes it. It is the light of God's love refracted through the cross. Listen to that. The light of God's love refracted through the cross. In the same chapter, Tishrol also writes, in the end, darkness is not explained, it is defeated. Night is not justified or solved, it is endured until light overcomes it and it is no more. Before you will see this truth, before you will understand these things, you need to be clothed in a foundation you can move about in. This is not to say that the Old Testament scriptures present an ambiguous view of God, or that God can therefore be anything you want God to be. Not at all. The garment of praise in Isaiah 61 is placed upon liberated souls specifically so that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations, wearing the foundation of the scriptures, wearing the foundation of the history of Israel, the prophets, the Psalms, the law. I don't mean to mix scriptural metaphors, but if you'll understand it, Paul writes, no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ, as he was the embodiment of the law. These then are the clothes the apostles were already wearing before Pentecost. They already had these things before Pentecost. Jesus' own words and the foundation of the law, the prophets, and the Psalms, clothes that beautifully shape without restricting, that move with the wearer even, perhaps especially during times of trial. Jesus used last year's fashions, if you will, to prepare the apostles to put on the latest style. Look at verse 45. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. See, they already had this foundation. They already had the foundation of the law, and the prophets, and the Psalms. They already had, were wearing the garment of praise. But he opened their minds to understand the scriptures Notice, Jesus doesn't tell them to take off last year's garments. He doesn't tell them to take off what they're already wearing. 
He doesn't send the Old Testament packing off to the Goodwill store. He opened their minds to understand what had already been written. He opened their hearts to wear the garments differently. It's as if he was saying, did you people know that you don't need to get two friends to help you get dressed every morning and pull the corset as tight as possible around your heart? Let me show you a better way to wear these things. And so he said in verse 46 that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You see, Jesus bore the full corset, the full constraint of the law so that you and I wouldn't have to. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5, for our sake, God made him to be sin. Who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Only somebody, only a person who had never needed to be tightly corseted in could repair the damage done to each of us by the course that we were wearing. Who had been so constricted. You are witnesses of these things, Jesus said. Now that you've learned how to wear the garment of praise and to be comfortable in it, I've got one more thing that I want you to wear. Behold, he said, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. You go to Jerusalem and wait. I'll be along soon, and there I will dress you. What I want you to take away from this morning's message is this. Christ must dress you in his righteousness. He must clothe you with the Holy Spirit. You can't do it on your own. I can't give you an exercise whereby you can clothe yourself in the Holy Spirit. It'll never happen. Every notion that you've ever had about how to cope with this world, every notion you've ever had about how to live through this moment, if it doesn't come from Jesus clothing you in the Holy Spirit, it'll be wrong. I might be able to help you with a picture of this. this let's think back to Downton Abbey again. Some of you will remember Mosley the valet. Those of you who know the series well will remember how angry Mosley got at Matthew Crawley when the future Lord Grantham wanted to dress himself. In private, Mosley complained to Mr. Bates, the butler. Here's the quote. It says, he chooses his clothes himself. He puts them out at night and hangs the one he's worn. To be honest, Mr. Bates, I don't see the point of it. It's bad enough that we humans want to dress in any fashion we like, even though Jesus has already picked out comfortable, well-fitting clothes with room to breathe in, in any situation. But when Jesus tells us to wait until we are further clothed with the Holy Spirit, our impatience turns to exasperation. No, we say, like Matthew Crawley. Thank you very much. I'm perfectly capable of dressing myself. How egalitarian of you. Mosley has finally had enough. He's standing there, unable to do anything for this man, and he... In his exasperated state, Mosley says, just let me show you some cufflink options for the love of God. 
We want the Holy Spirit to be a whole new flashy outfit that we can put on all by ourselves. The modern church glitzes him up with all kinds of sequins, and when that doesn't work, we add bright lights, a runway, and loud music. What Jesus did for his apostles was all so simple, though. They were already wearing everything they needed. Do you see it? They had the foundations. They had the garment of praise on. It was just one more thing that they needed. See, they were witnesses of these things already. Jesus simply wants to offer the church a pair of cufflinks that will complete the ensemble so that he can stand back and look at us and say, perfect. I don't know whether the miracles done by and through the apostles died out at the end of the first century as some of the church believes or whether they're still going on today. It's a useless argument. The church has argued that point for hundreds of years. What I do know is that in the main, the activity of the Holy Spirit is like that pair of cufflinks. They're smart. You know, they, they give the wearer a certain kind of confidence that comes from knowing you're dressed for the moment, dressed properly for the moment. Nobody's going to say, hey, those cufflinks really stand out. In fact, they probably won't notice them in most cases. And most people won't notice that Christ has clothed you with his Holy Spirit. Are there moments when the Holy Spirit stands out like a Tiffany set diamond on a chain? Yeah, sure. The day of Pentecost was one of those moments. But in the main, you'll know that the Holy Spirit is working when the whole outfit is understated. And you just feel like you're dressed right for the moment. Why? Because nobody, nobody, not even on Downton Abbey, would wear a tuxedo or an evening gown to bring good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of a prison to those who are bound. That's what we've been dressed for. Let's pray. Clothe us in your Holy Spirit that we may do, as you said, greater works than these. Clothe us in the understated garment, the understated thing that your Holy Spirit can do. It is not something we let ourselves do. It's something you alone can do. Clothe us in your Holy Spirit. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. As we did last week, I'm going to ask that we all remain for five minutes. Those of you who are watching online are welcome to partake with us. It'll be silence. And <clears throat> the final use of that card I gave you is uh, we're going to enter into a time of listening prayer as we look and ask the Holy Spirit, what is the thing that he has fit this church to be and to do as we move forward? And so it's, we're not looking for um, ideas. That's a great thing of, of you know, events we can do. We're not looking to come up with possible you know, fundraisers or something like that. What's, what is it that this church is fit for in the Holy Spirit? And that can be, that the Holy Spirit wants us to be and to do moving forward. That's a big question. 
So um, we're just going to sit for five minutes. You got the card. If you if you feel like the Holy Spirit's telling you something, you can write that down. Just let us know that that's what you've written on the card. And uh, and we'll after five minutes we'll go off and have some coffee together.
and stand and turn and face one another, pick somebody to sing to. That should be easy. <clears throat> Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Ooh, donut holes. Everyone run for room six. <laughs>